feels like there's been no time mm. lapse. It almost feels like, you know, that you're continuously yesterday. living in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, people say, you know, you must miss Nadine. Like, we miss her beyond. Mm. But it still doesn't feel like it's two years ago mm -hmm. since I see her. Like, I still feel mm -hmm. she's here. Like, you mm -hmm. never... I think it's, I don't know whether it's just you won't ever own up or recognize mm -hmm. the fact that you're never going to see her. Yeah. You know, in my mind, mm -hmm. she's here, in my mind. At some point, she's, because my life has continued to be exactly the same. Mm -hmm. I continue to work, I continue to live in the same house. Mm -hmm. yes. I continue to have Kaya, you have a, bit, um, a different role with Kaya now. Mm -hmm. But Kaya would have been here, so none of that is new so I just expect Cotton Nadine to walk in. And mm -hmm. Today our case brings us back to 2019 and to the town of Arklow in County Wicklow. Arklow in its day was one of the busiest ports in Ireland and a renowned centre for boat building and sea fishing as well as having a fine tradition in the pottery industry. I want to start off by reading the victim impact statement of Claire Lott the mother of Nadine who lost her life to a monster, the father of her child, Daniel Murtaugh. Claire's statement best describes who Nadine was and shows by no mistake her character by using the words of the person who knew her best. Nadine was a textbook baby. She was a bubbly child. She loved to run around and make people laugh. She was a loving child. I would say to her, what would I do without you? Her response was, be lost, mummy. This phrase was said often, even up to our last day together, and here I am now, lost. Nadine was the popular one, the caring one. Nadine played a huge part in the caring of her nanny, my mother, in her last few months, prior to her passing in February of 2019. She would read, sing songs, and climb onto the bed to give comforting cuddles, and was also a rock to my father in his mourning giving of her time so generously. It was not a task for Nadine. She did it without a thought, as this was Nadine's nature. In 2019, Nadine was 30 years old and at a point in her life where she was happy. She had her daughter, Kaya, her apartment, her car and her job as a beautician. And she had even been approached to do some modeling and financially she was secure. She supported herself and her daughter as a single mother which she always had done since Kaya's birth. Her life had come together in every way. Nadine's words to her mother, quote, I'm actually so happy I don't need anything else. This she said to her mother on a holiday to Rome for her 30th birthday. But we will go back further in time, back to 2012. Nadine would go to Australia on a work visa for a year. She moved to Darwin, the capital of Australia's vast North Territory. Nadine got on well there working as a beautician. There she would meet a man named Daniel Murtaugh. Nadine would describe him to the family as funny and a great laugh. He was from Dublin and over in Australia on a work visa also, working as a window fitter. It was a type of holiday romance, Nadine's mother would say. But in 2013, Nadine found herself pregnant by Daniel and decided to come home to be near family before she gave birth. Daniel would follow a few months later. He didn't show much interest in the pregnancy and was not there for little Kaya's birth. Nadine's sister, Phoebe, took that honour. Daniel was from Clondalkin in Dublin and was not a very savoury character. He was fond of the single life, loved his drugs and drink and he was number one. Nadine and Kaya were an afterthought. Nadine, on the other hand, did nothing but try for the first three years of Kaya's life. She would make excuses for Daniel when he didn't show up for her and Kaya. She invited him to family events and tried her best to sustain the relationship for the sake of Kaya, having a father figure in her life. Nadine grew up in a very close-knit family and wanted her own little family and to make the best of the situation. By 2016, Nadine and Daniel had spent their time being on again and off again as far as their relationship. Nadine even organised a viewing to see an apartment that the three of them could move into. It was her last ditch attempt 
to move things along with Daniel and build a life together. But Daniel had other plans and disappeared for three days at that time. Nadine had had enough and called the relationship off for good and began building her life without him in it. Nadine said she wasn't upset about him and didn't care about him but was willing to remain friendly for the sake of Kaya. Daniel would promise to visit Kaya and not show up. Money for Kaya had to be handed over personally by Daniel. He had to be in control. The family said that they felt he wanted to see Nadine more than he wanted to see Kaya. Kaya was just his way of seeing Nadine. Daniel disliked Nadine seeing anyone else, even though they were not together. Nadine did have to keep things from him. She said, quote, it's easier. I don't have to put up with the grief. At one stage, Nadine went on a date with a Turkish guy and the next day she got a text from Daniel, quote, so you were out on a date. I think I'll go and get my hair cut at a Turkish barber's. Nadine's mother, Claire, recalls it was him letting her know that he knew she had been out with this guy. That was a regular thing. Despite her feelings, Nadine never criticised Daniel in front of Kaya. If he never came to Arklo or never turned up when he was supposed to, Nadine would make an excuse for him. She would do anything to make it easier for Kaya to accept. Daniel had never been violent, but liked to assert his control. Nadine was very open and would have said to her family or friends if he had been violent. In hindsight, Daniel clearly tried to control Nadine. At the time, the family would not have looked at it as controlling, but he was trying to have everything on his terms. Claire, Nadine's mother, would say, I think he just wanted her to always be there, and she was his. He thought he could pick up and leave when he wanted. He could control her, even though they had not been a couple in years. On the 13th of December 2019, the Lot family attended six-year-old Kaya's ballet dance recital. It was also Nadine's aunt's birthday, and the whole family were heading out that night for drinks. Nadine had arranged with Daniel to come down from Dublin to look after Kaya while they were out. She had even invited him for Christmas dinner, as Nadine was hosting it that year. In the early hours of the 14th, Gardy received a call around 4.25am from Nadine's neighbour. She told Gardy that Nadine needed urgent help. She had been stabbed. When Gardy arrived at the apartment, they found Nadine lying on the floor of the kitchen, with her mother trying to help her. Gardy called an ambulance straight away, telling the dispatcher that Nadine, quote, had been beaten to a pulp. There was no sign of Daniel. He had already left in his car. Nadine was brought to St. Vincent's Hospital. She would never regain consciousness and would succumb to her injuries three days later, passing away on the 17th of December, surrounded by her family and friends. In the meantime, Daniel had been arrested hours after the attack on Nadine. He had fled and crashed his car near Lara in County Wicklow and was taken to hospital with no life-threatening injuries. Here he was arrested and brought into custody for questioning. He would give a total of four interviews, all conducted before Nadine passed away. The details would get progressively worse as he relayed what had happened and how he had beaten poor Nadine that night. He was charged with murder once Nadine died and remanded in custody until the trial, which would take place in July of 2021 at the Central Criminal Court in Dublin. There would be many witnesses in the trial, including Nadine's daughter, Kaya, her mother, Claire, her sister and brother, her neighbour, Gardy, paramedics, hospital staff that treated Nadine, among many others. Opening the trial on the 20th of July 2021 was the prosecution stating that Nadine had suffered severe blunt force trauma and stab injuries at the hands of her former partner in a sustained attack in her home in Arklow. The barrister said the court will hear evidence that the injuries to Nadine were so serious that she never regained consciousness and died three days later in St. Vincent's Hospital in Dublin. Daniel pleaded not guilty to murder, but guilty to manslaughter, and it was his job to prove to the jury of seven men and five women that it was murder. The first to give evidence was the Garda that arrived on the scene first. She said when she entered the apartment, she noticed an intense smell of blood straight away. Nadine was lying on the kitchen floor beside her mother, with her head pushed up against the skirting board and surrounded by a large pool of blood. 
There was a butter knife in the pool of blood and broken glass on the floor. The Garda said the left side of Nadine's face was extremely and grotesquely swollen and her left eye was completely swollen shut. Her lips were bloodstained and there were several puncture wounds over her face and neck. Nadine was unresponsive and labouring, trying to breathe. Nadine had a stab wound over and under her left eye, on both sides of her face and a puncture wound to the front of her neck. This was the same Garda that rang for the ambulance and relayed to them that Nadine had been beaten to a pulp. Blood was coming from everywhere as she administered CPR. When she was instructed to make sure Nadine's airways were clear, she put her fingers in her mouth and noticed she was missing some teeth. Nadine was brought to the emergency department and then transferred to ICU. The doctor there told the Garda that Nadine had received life-altering injuries with paralysis of the face and if she survived she would have no sight in her left eye. The Garda testified that it was the worst scene she had seen in her 14 years of service with Angarda Shikana. She said she had never seen a person beaten so badly and described the night as a pretty bad experience. The attending paramedic was next to testify. He told the court he arrived at the scene at 4.36am and Nadine had a very faint pulse which they lost at least three times. Nadine was unresponsive, unconscious and had no verbal communication. She had lost an extensive amount of blood at this stage and had to be moved from the kitchen to the living room to allow 360 degree access so that up to four paramedics in conjunction with the armed response team unit could work on her. Another paramedic that was on the scene described it as horrendous and the worst he had ever walked into. He said it was extremely and unbelievably difficult, very emotional and very charged. He said Nadine had horrific lacerations to her face. Quote, her injuries were so severe and her body was soaked in blood that it was difficult to see where all of the injuries were. The same paramedic also described the apartment. He said it was like a bulldozer had gone through it as there was broken furniture, frames and mirrors everywhere. They were all walking on broken glass and even had to kneel on it while attending Nadine. Finally, he said it was one of those call-outs which would haunt him for the rest of his career and beyond. They tried so hard to keep Nadine alive that one of the Gardaí drove the ambulance to the hospital so the three paramedics could work on her in the back of the ambulance until they got there. The nurse that was on duty in the ER that night also gave a testimony to the court. She spoke of the damage that was done to Nadine. She was losing a lot of blood and they pumped a total of 42 units of blood into her within 24 hours. Bits of wood, ceramic and reflective glass were matted into Nadine's hair, describing one piece looking like a piece of dinner plate. She told the court that Nadine was tiny and her head was huge in comparison to her little body because of the swelling around her face. The nurse then became emotional when she described doing her best to make Nadine as presentable as possible that day as her family were coming in later. It didn't make a massive difference what I did as they had already seen her at the scene, she added. The nurse broke down on the stand as she told the jury she could not check Nadine's pupils as her right eye was so physically swollen that they could not open it and they were unsure if her left eye was even present or if the eyeball was punctured. There was not one part of her body that didn't have injuries and her nose was continuously bleeding. Nadine was completely unrecognisable. Claire brought in photos of Nadine to the hospital and put them beside her bed. The staff on duty asked who it was and the nurse replied, that's Nadine. The boyfriend of Nadine's neighbour who called for help testified. He told the jury that he had seen Daniel getting into his own car and driving off and that he had gone to Nadine's apartment and said it was completely wrecked with broken mirrors and furniture everywhere. He told the jury that he only walked as far as the hallway and called her name and that he heard her gasping for air, adding she was lying on the floor and he could only see her shoulder through the hallway. The neighbour that found Nadine spoke of going to bed and hearing a noise outside her apartment. At first, she did not take much notice as she thought it was people coming home from Christmas work parties. But as she was getting into bed, she heard screams and banging coming from Nadine's apartment. So she got up to see if she was okay. 
When she got to her apartment, the door was open, and so she stepped in. What she witnessed next was Nadine on the floor of the kitchen, with Daniel over her, panting her face in. She told the court that Daniel was making a growling noise and was vicious with rage, like a wild animal. The neighbour ran from the apartment and first rang Nadine's sister Phoebe as they had gone to school together and then she rang the guardie. Claire, Nadine's mother, was next on the witness stand. She told the jury how they all had been out that night to celebrate a birthday and she had gone home before Nadine and had texted her but didn't get a reply. She gave evidence of how her daughter Phoebe was living with her at the time and on the morning of the 14th of December Phoebe had burst into her room telling her that Nadine was hurt and they needed to get to her. She told the jury that she left the house so quickly that she didn't even put on her shoes. When she entered the apartment with her son and daughter, all she heard was the cry that came from them both. There lying on the floor was Nadine, unconscious and gasping for air, wearing her pyjama bottoms and a tank top. Claire got down on the floor and told Nadine, quote, You're OK, we can do this. She added, it was absolutely excruciating, but I was doing what I could to try and save my daughter's life. She gave Nadine CPR until the ambulance arrived. I don't think anything I was doing helped really, she said. The next morning, Claire was cross-examined by the defence. It was put to Claire that Nadine and Daniel had got back together five to six times since they both returned to Ireland from Australia. Claire said this was not true. The defence barrister then asked if Daniel had stayed with Nadine in her apartment at other times up to her death. Claire told him that the only time Daniel had stayed at Nadine's was the night she was attacked by him. The defence then put it to Claire, quote, Would it be fair to say she didn't like Daniel? Claire's reply, I never said that. You are asking me that question where my daughter has been murdered. Before this, at times, I did like Daniel. He was Nadine's choice at that time, and then he wasn't, she replied. During court proceedings, Daniel made several admissions of fact to the court through his barrister. He accepted that he unlawfully killed Nadine, and he alone inflicted the injuries she suffered. But he did not intend to cause her grievous bodily harm, or to kill her. That on the night he had drank a shoulder of Captain Morgan, smoked a joint and taken two pills. The defence said the issue to be decided by the jury was his intent and in the broader sense his mental state at the time. Giving evidence as a witness to meeting Daniel in Lara County Wicklow on the morning of the 14th of December a man named Mr Begley took to the stand. He said he was travelling with his wife on the road near Lara and came upon a car crashed in the ditch. He initially thought that someone had been out at their Christmas party and had crashed. When he saw that no one was in the car, he continued driving on, but then saw a chap standing on the side of the road at Lara GAA pitch. He was staggering, his legs weren't moving. The man fell to the ground as he drove by, and so he reversed back his car to check on him. Mr Begley asked him if he was okay, and noticed that his trousers and underwear were about his knees and he had no shoes on. Mr Begley's wife rang for an ambulance as they noticed he had blood on his hands and on the side of his head. The man told him that his name was Daniel Murta and he was from Clondalkin in Dublin. Daniel asked Mr Begley was he a guard and told him, quote, you're not very good at interrogating. It would be an hour before the ambulance arrived and Daniel was taken to Talla Hospital, arriving there at 10 a.m., where he would be later arrested. Mr Begley also said that Daniel became very agitated when he told him the guards were down the road looking over the crashed car. Daniel said to him, quote, You don't know what I have done. He told him that he had killed his wife because she was with his friend. He also said he hoped she wasn't dead and that to tell his family he was sorry. When the ambulance arrived, Daniel complained of head, back and leg pain. He told him that he suffered from PTSD and had taken two Valiums at 10pm the day before and had been drinking. He also told the paramedic that he killed his girlfriend. The paramedic told his colleague and he in turn told the Gardaí. The Gardaí was also informed that Daniel had told Mr Begley he killed his wife. 
The jury were also told that Daniel had kept repeating in the back of the ambulance that he loved his girlfriend, that they had been together for years, but they had had a fight. The next morning in court, several Gardaí took to the stand to read out the statements given by Daniel over the four interviews which were conducted before Nadine passed away. The interviews began with Daniel playing down what he had done, but as the interviews went on, the details got progressively worse as the truth emerged. In the fourth interview, he admitted he, quote, went too far with his hand and that's it. He called Nadine his future wife, quote, now you are telling me that my future wife is barely going to wake up. Her friends get battered by their fellas nearly every week, he added. It would also come out in interviews that a cable and charger was found on the sofa in the living room. They were covered in blood. When Daniel was asked about them, he admitted that he had held the charger in his closed fist and wrapped the cable around his closed fist for solidity. He even said that as he was punching Nadine, the cable left hanging was getting in his way. So he stood on it, breaking it and continued pounding down on Nadine's face, head and body. A complete wild animal. Daniel demonstrated this to Gardee in his interview by leaning forward in his chair and punched the air downwards towards the ground, confirming Nadine was already on the ground as he punched her. He also said that Nadine was lying on her right side with her left side facing upwards as he punched her. Later autopsy results showed that most of the damage was done to the left side of her face. He also admitted that he was a semi-professional boxer, that he had boxed for years. The guardian noticed that there was not much damage to his hands. Daniel admitted that from his years of boxing, his knuckles were conditioned. While the guardian were being cross-examined by the defence, they admitted that the reoccurring theme from Daniel, that while he admitted assaulting Nadine, he did not intend to seriously injure her. And it was a constant reoccurring theme that he only intended to give her, quote, a few slaps. Another contention in the interviews was that Daniel said the assault only happened in the living room. And when told that Nadine was found in the kitchen, he insisted he left her in the living room, quote, still breathing. But forensics would say something different as Nadine's blood was found in the kitchen on walls, cabinets and other furnishings, along with Daniel's fingerprint in Nadine's blood. Drag marks of blood were also present from the living room to the kitchen, so it was obvious Nadine had been dragged by Daniel to the kitchen. Daniel also denied stabbing Nadine, but she had a cut from her ear down along her jawline and a stab wound into her neck. The guard has said that Daniel stated, if not once but 50 times, that he only used his fists, but said he knew Nadine would not be getting up to watch Love Island that day. Scumbag. Daniel said nothing would have happened that night if he was sober, not taking drink and drugs and had been, quote, let sleep it off on the couch, rather than be awoken and told to get out by Nadine because he was smoking and drinking in the apartment while looking after Kaya. The guardie asked Daniel was he pissed off because Nadine had not answered his missed call and text that night and probably down the town with another man. He said he was not triggered at all, but he was a little bit hurt. He said he would love for guardie to get inside his head and have, quote, a little wonder to see why he did what he did. He would later say, I knew she was with a lad in Arklo and I was trying to get it out of her. Daniel told Gardy that he and Nadine were in the process of getting back together. He claimed that they were having sex, but text messages recovered from both Nadine's phone and Daniel's made it quite clear that they were not back together, that Nadine was willing to co-parent with him and be civil in order for Kaya to have her father in her life. I know from personal experience that this is possible. Boundaries need to be respected and the child needs to come first. Even if one parent still has feelings towards the other, it must be put aside. Otherwise, this is a prime example of what can happen. Daniel went from, quote, loving Nadine, being intoxicated at the time of the assault and not remembering anything, to admitting to giving her a soft slap to hitting her a few slaps, 
after giving her six or seven hard digs, but not going to town on her, to pounding her with his fists and punching like mad, to taking a charger in his hand and wrapping the cable around his hand for solidity and punching her, showing no mercy, to slicing her beautiful face and stabbing her in the neck, all the while their six-year-old Kaya watched on. Kaya begged him to leave her mammy alone, cried and screamed at him to stop hurting her mother, but also having the wherewithal to hide his phone and wallet, so if he did abscond, she had the proof he was there and did this to her mother. An absolute hero little Kaya was for her mother. She helped in putting him behind bars, the man she once called her dad, but who was now the monster that lived inside her head who she had to watch this terrible act over and over that night. Chief State Pathologist Dr Linda Mulligan noted that the blunt force injuries were caused by hands, fists or feet and the use of a blunt weapon could not be ruled out. The court heard there was a total of 64 injuries observed all over Nadine's body. Nadine died from a combination of traumatic head, neck and chest injuries and her brain was swollen following the sustained and violent attack. On Tuesday, the 3rd of August, the judge asked the jurors to act clinically, dispassionately and without sympathy towards the deceased, her family and the accused or his family. Referring to the presumption of innocence, Mr Justice McGrath said the fact that Daniel had pleaded guilty to manslaughter did not alter his presumption of innocence, which he enjoyed in respect of the charge of murder. The burden lies on the prosecution to prove every element of the offence, he added. He told the jurors that murder was a crime of specific intent, which occurs when one person unlawfully kills another, intending that person to be killed or cause serious harm. He reminded them also that Daniel accepted he had killed Nadine by his axe and that the killing was unlawful. However, he said it also meant Daniel did not accept He had the necessary mental element when he did the acts to Nadine. He told the jury to focus on the accused's intention that night. If the jury decided the accused did not intend to kill Nadine, they must consider whether he intended to seriously injure her. If you come to the conclusion that the evidence establishes that he did intend to seriously injure Nadine, but not kill her, that is still murder as murder is a crime of specific intent, he explained. Referring to the accused's defence of intoxication, the judge said it was a defence for a crime of specific intent, such as murder, and can reduce the offence of murder to manslaughter. On the 5th of August 2021, the jury at the Central Criminal Court in Dublin found Daniel guilty of the murder of Nadine unanimously rejecting his defence after almost six hours of deliberation over two days. On the 4th of October, he received the mandatory sentence of life imprisonment. Here, the victim impact statements will be heard. Claire, Nadine's mam, said they were haunted by Nadine's terror, fear, panic and cries on that night during the prolonged evil attack and the family now sees traumatic counselling replace hobbies Night terrors and sleepless nights replaced sleep. Life replaced with existence. Nadine Lott's mother Claire in the black floral dress leading the family out of the criminal courts today after her beloved daughter's murderer was convicted. She can be seen with Nadine's sisters Tanith in the black and Phoebe beside her with the pink floral dress and blonde hair. Their father David Lott to Phoebe's right. They are very relieved following the verdict and will give victim impact evidence in October. During the trial Claire Lott recalled the moment she found Nadine lying on her back in the kitchen in the early hours of the morning gurgling and gasping for air. She said she couldn't recognise recognised that it was Nadine. Such were the young woman's injuries. Just after 12 noon, the jury convicted 34-year-old Daniel Murta of Nadine's murder following five hours and 46 minutes of deliberations. He had denied her murder, telling Garthi he didn't intend to kill her as he repeatedly punched her in the early hours of the 14th of December 2019 in Nadine's apartment in Arklow, County Wicklow. His defence was that he was intoxicated. He referred to Nadine in those interviews as his future wife. 
Nadine sustained severe blunt force trauma and stab injuries at the hands of her former partner who she had texted two weeks beforehand telling him not to threaten her and that nothing was ever going to happen between them. Her neighbour who heard screams that morning ran over to the apartment and witnessed Myrta inflicting blows on Nadine and said he was vicious with rage growling like an animal. Nadine died three days later in hospital. An intensive care nurse telling the court the beautician was completely unrecognisable. She'd never seen anyone so badly injured. Officers from Wicklow State who investigated the murder described it as a difficult and harrowing case. They were never in doubt about Daniel Murta's intent to kill. In 40 years of policing, I've never seen or read of such a level of violence used towards an individual. It, there was never any doubt in our minds from the very start about the intent here. The intent was to kill Nadine and that was it. They were separated for quite a long time. Nadine had made it very clear that she wanted no form of a relationship. The perpetrator in this case seems to have been clearly deluded about the status of his relationship with Nadine. Murta told investigators he had been boxing for years. He admitted holding a charger in his fist and wrapping the wire around his knuckles for solidity as he beat Nadine. Today they said that spoke volumes about the type of person he is. Daniel Murta sat in the dock dressed in a grey suit and pink shirt as the jury returned their unanimous guilty verdict this afternoon. He looked straight ahead and didn't react as they convicted him of murdering his former partner Nadine Lott, meaning that they didn't believe his claims that he didn't intend to kill her when he was beating down on her with his fists in the early hours of that morning. He waved to his family members who were in the back of the court before he was led away. Victim impact evidence will be heard on October the 4th and at that stage he'll receive the mandatory life term. Sarah O'Connor, Virgin Media News at the Central Criminal Court in Dublin. It was also revealed at his sentencing hearing that Daniel had nine previous convictions, including one from 2011 for threatening and abusive behaviour. Daniel was brought to Whitfield Prison to serve out his sentence of 18 years minimum before he could apply for parole. Daniel did appeal and it has not yet been granted for a hearing. Daniel was not long in prison when he received death threats. He was eventually moved to Port Leash High Security Prison, but again he got himself into trouble. He tried to throw his weight around on B1 landing of the Midlands Prison, which is normally a peaceful area of the prison. Daniel got mouthy and cocky and was attacked with a homemade shiv, slicing his face from his forehead to his chin. A source also said that he was warned to shut his mouth and he didn't listen. No second warning is ever given. Next, it's a physical attack, which he received. Now that he has been warned physically, if he steps out of line again, he will be killed. Basically, he was told he is a dead man walking. Prison staff are not willing to take the chance and so he is now segregated from the other prisoners for his own safety. Today, Claire, Nadine's mother, believes her daughter's identity got lost during the trial. From the minute the trial started to when it finished, it was all about him. Her daughter's voice was not heard until the victim impact statements were read out. That's why it was so important to do it as a family. Nadine was neither a wife nor a girlfriend. She was a mother, a daughter, a sister, a granddaughter and a niece. Nadine is talked about every day to keep her memory alive for Kaya. They talk about Nadine as if she is still here. It's almost like she will walk in the door, Claire said. She also said, you live in 2019 and in those couple of weeks before Nadine passed, where everything was fine, that's where you live. The Nadine Lot Trust Fund has been set up in Nadine's memory and as a secure fund for Kaya's benefit throughout her life. Kaya is doing well. She still misses her mammy every day and is well aware that she's the only one in school without a mammy and no one can replace that for her. But it's not a path she has to walk alone. She has her mammy watching over her and she has a loving family that are willing to take care of her and give her the life she deserves.